Chapter 15 Aspirologies There are trendy approaches that often work against customer centricity. Aspirologies is my made-up term for approaches that don't deserve the credibility of being called methodologies since they often hurt processes, morale, and outcomes. Since these are currently popular and at some companies beloved, we will need to keep our critical thinking hats on as I ask you to reconsider approaches that you might currently respect, admire, or utilize. The main aspirologies you will run into are design sprints, design thinking, lean UX from the Lean UX book, which is neither lean nor UX, and democratization, which we covered in the Common Research Mistakes chapter. Many of these approaches revolve heavily around the use of group and team workshops, often spanning hours or days. Aspirologies have several common characteristics you can easily recognize. 1. Codependency. CX or UX seems to require others to do their jobs for and with them. 2. Disrespect of teammates' time. Coworkers must pause their mission critical work for hours or days to participate in aspirologies. 3. Speed over quality. Aspirologies try to make CX or design work faster taking hours or days instead of weeks or longer. Aspirologies are less concerned about outcomes and more concerned about time boxes. But cycles of workshops, guesses, and experiments often take more time and money than using a thorough UCD process the first time. 4. Reliance on Assumptions Aspirologies increase business and project risk by running with guesses and hoping that'll save time. We should document the risks of running with assumptions and then challenge our assumptions. 5. Giving specialized work to non-specialists. Aspirologies love giving CX work to those without CX knowledge, experience, expertise, skill, or talent. But where else would we do that? We don't give back-end database architecture to anybody with spare time or an interest in databases. Non-CX roles never give up power or decisions in their own domains. We don't have the cross-functional team all making engineering decisions. 6. Team Building Theater If Aspirology workshops were great for team building, we would hold these workshops in every domain. We'd have product, engineering, business analysis, and marketing workshops, but we don't, because high-performing teams respect each other's specialties and play to each other's strengths, rather than trying to turn everybody into a broad generalist. 7. Customer Centricity Theater We pretend that we really care about customers and their satisfaction, but we guess who they are and what they need. We don't observe or research the people we're building for. 8. Empathy Theater We pretend that we have empathy or sympathy, but if we cared about users' experiences, we wouldn't rush out garbage that doesn't solve customers' problems and improve their task accomplishment. 9. Innovation Theater How many never-before-seen, world-premier ideas came out of these workshops? How many innovations were non-viable? How many of our innovations made it to market, and how did they do? 10. Vote for the winner. We shouldn't pick products, features, or concepts American Idol style. We have user-centered design to guide us in finding the best solution for our target audiences. We don't all gather together, spend hours or days brainstorming various product roadmaps, and then vote on our favorite roadmap. CX architects don't hang designs at their desks and invite coworkers to vote. Voting on our favorite anything is self-centric. 10. Fun Craft Time Many workshops could instead be a simple meeting where something is discussed or socialized. Why infantilize or distract business discussions and decisions with games, wackiness, or crafts. If your company has a cultural need for fun craft time, schedule that. 
but ensure that crafts and exercises are not around tasks or decisions in any work domain. 11. Emotional Outcomes and No Accountability We often hear, everybody enjoyed the workshop, but where are the actual budget and ROI figures? Does our workshop have success criteria? How will we measure that the original goals and purpose for the workshop were achieved and it were worth the time and money we spent? When workshops fail us or our customers, how do we ensure that we don't repeat the same errors? Or do we schedule another workshop, possibly with more people, to do another round of guesses and brainstorming? If we believe in continuous improvement and accountability, then we must make sure that we are not caught in cycles of fun workshops that burn time and money but produce little or no results. 12. Enough buzzwords thrown in so that it sounds like CX even if it's not CX. You'll hear about customer journey maps, personas, problem solving, prototypes, and testing. In a workshop environment, these artifacts and documents are often guesses. We prioritize speed and checking them off a list as done over the quality of the artifacts. As we learned earlier, making these artifacts doesn't mean that they have been made well or will set us up for success. 14. Not accessible. Many on-site and online tools used in these workshops are not accessible. The very nature of the workshops might be a mismatch for someone with anxiety, autism, memory issues, introversion, shyness, or another trait, condition, or diagnosis. How are we ensuring that everybody is included in ways that best suit them? Are we allowing people to decline these workshops? 15. Design or problem solving only takes hours or days. Aspirologies teach leaders and teammates that if we have a problem to solve, just throw some people in a room for hours or days. It sometimes sounds like the more wicked the problem, the less time we will spend on it. Companies went from believing in full R&D with qualified researchers, scientists, futurists, etc., to believing that these same challenges can be solved in days with sticky notes, plastic blocks, and predefined brainstorming games. End of list. Aspirologies disempower customer centricity. It's hard to teach the value of great customer experiences and thorough CX work while teaching teammates and leaders that CX can be done quickly in workshops, with templates, and often with little or no research. Aspirologies work against evidence-based design and decision-making. Aspirologies are hurting ways of working, morale, and the quality of what we deliver to customers. You don't have to take my word for it. You can reflect on the above list, examine the ROI, check on employee and customer outcomes, and decide what's truly working well. Use the governance model from the Common Research Mistakes chapter. Try it. Your best ideas. Many people find that they are most creative when left to themselves in a peaceful environment where their brains can make new connections. Harvard Business Review has published multiple articles on how brainstorming alone is more effective than in groups, including Your Team is Brainstorming All Wrong, weblink cxcc.to slash a183. In the coming days and weeks, notice when and where you get your best ideas. In scheduled brainstorm meetings? When you first wake up? In the shower? Taking a walk? If you have ever come up with an innovative and fresh idea, where were you and what were you doing? Let's dive deeper into the three main aspirologies we haven't covered yet, design thinking, design sprints, and lean UX, and why they are often customer peripheric. Design sprints. Design sprints are presented as a fast way to solve challenges, design PSE, or innovate in just a few days. Over a decade ago, they were considered a good way for a startup without CX staff and usually without research insights 
to brainstorm their way to the PSE that would be the MVP. A typical design sprint involves seven people or fewer, and one is designated as the decision maker. One might hope that this is a CX expert, but it is often the CEO of a small company, a high-level leader, or a key stakeholder. If not facilitated very carefully, the design sprint can be a drawn-out, days-long, extended version of we'll just do what this higher-paid person wants. It is not required that CX specialists be facilitators or even present, and executing good qualitative research before the design sprint is often treated as optional. Professional facilitators started finding problems with design sprints, so they created new versions. This is not an evolution where nobody uses version 1 anymore because newer versions exist. Teams can select which version they prefer to use. The original version 1 of design sprints devotes five days to defining the problem, ideating or sketching potential solutions, deciding which sketch is the winner through voting, prototyping the winning concept, often a quick paper prototype, and testing. Defining the problem typically includes everybody in the workshop putting together a customer journey map, personas, or an empathy map. We have already explored some problems that can arise when these documents are not based on current data from good qualitative research. Version 2 of Design Sprints does not allow workshop attendees to prototype or test. The Design Sprint is two days long and over after picking the winner. Prototyping and testing were deemed too important, so these tasks are done by CX experts who report later how they went. Version 3 of Design Sprints removed everything relating to defining the problem so that people aren't guessing or going with what they think users do. Facilitators found that the problem the stakeholder presented often couldn't be validated. Version 3 requires experts to do weeks of qualitative research before the design sprint starts. Observational studies, interviews, personas, journey maps, and other artifacts are not done as team exercises. Research data is then shown to design sprint attendees so they can understand customers and the problem. Figure 31. Visualization of the three versions of design sprints broken into days. Tasks in orange boxes are given to specialists rather than done by all attendees. The visualization is explained above and below the image. If we remove what Design Sprints versions 2 and 3 want done by experts, the only group exercise we have left is everybody sketch solutions and vote on your favorite. Going back to our list of Asperology common characteristics, asking everybody to sketch ideas can make it look like your CX architects or designers can't do their jobs themselves. The winning idea and its winning execution should be determined through user-centered design, rounds of information architecture, interaction design, testing, and iteration. This would be more customer-centric, having involved real or archetypal customers and not our internal team picking their favorites. Design sprints are devolving. Who's making these changes? The facilitation agencies making wild money running design sprints. Like any good capitalists, they want to make money and look good by creating better outcomes for clients. These facilitators appear to have found that better outcomes happen when you take tasks away from the design sprint attendees. One design sprint facilitation company sells version 3, starting with six weeks of research and then four weeks of planning the design sprint before it starts. Ten weeks doesn't feel much like a sprint. It sounds like we're getting closer to proper user-centered design, in which case we should just do user-centered design. A random email invited me to a webinar about validating your product roadmap with a two-hour design sprint. If we developed the roadmap through customer insights prioritization and included collaboration between product, CX, and engineering, it's a valid roadmap. How did we previously validate our roadmaps and 
get stakeholder buy-in. How is a two-hour design sprint better than whatever we do now? Is a two-hour meeting really a design sprint? Design sprints are not designed for validating roadmaps. Will we be empathizing with the roadmap? The webinar also suggests that you can learn to run multiple design sprints in a week, which makes it sound like the biggest problem with design sprints is that two, four, or five days were too long. Are we slapping design sprint and design thinking on every method and training in the hope that people will attend? What is design thinking? An immediate problem with design thinking is its definition. What is design thinking? Over the past few years, I have been told that it is a mindset, process, methodology, philosophy, pedagogy, and tool in a toolbox. I've been told that it is the same as human-centered design, and I've been told that it is completely different from human-centered design. I've been told that it is a derivative of human-centered design, and I've been told that it has nothing to do with human-centered design because human-centered design is old-fashioned and out of style. I've been told that design thinking is something we are all doing naturally because we are all thinkers and we are all designers, whether that be drawing, arranging furniture, or putting together a nice outfit. And I've been told that we are not doing it naturally and we all need to get training and certification. The best definition I can provide is, design thinking is a boiled down, skimped on micro derivative of human-centered design that has become a cottage industry. Design thinking slims weeks or months of mission-critical user-centered design work into stages often called empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. Ideate, prototype, and test might sound like user-centered design, though the design thinking version prioritizes speed over quality. Empathize varies. In some cases, deep research is suggested. In other cases, we run with what the design thinking workshop's attendees know, assume, or believe about customers. In some cases, workshop attendees guess at customer journey maps, personas, and other documents that are supposed to be the artifacts of qualitative research. Design thinking is presented as the way to solve any problem, especially wicked problems. In January 2020, a Fortune article stated that design thinking could solve the coronavirus. Weblink cxcc.to slash a122 we must have done design thinking poorly since as of this chapter's writing in October 2022, the coronavirus still has not been solved. The article suggested that the entire country of China, which in January 2020 was allegedly wholly at fault for the coronavirus, just needed more empathy and iteration. Never mind those urban planners, epidemiologists, zoologists, sociologists, medical experts, medical lab researchers, and others who might be involved in helping to stop a pandemic. They all need more design thinking. This article has not aged well. Episode 108 of my live-streamed video podcast was What Isn't Design Thinking? Weblink cxcc.to slash a108 a guest and I walked through multiple definitions of design thinking and noticed one key thing in common. None of the sources told you how to do design thinking or any of its steps. What does empathizing look like? What does not empathizing look like? What if we make the wrong type of prototype? What if our testing doesn't recruit the correct number of participants from our target audiences? Design thinking has become like religion. It's anything and everywhere. It's listening and imagining and making and new solutions. People saying it's a mindset might tell you it's absolutely not a process. People saying it's a process might tell you it's absolutely not a philosophy. Each person believes in their own one true design thinking, with all others being false. 
In addition to the amorphous and chameleon-like definitions of design thinking, its origin story is also troubling. I recommend my article, Was Design Thinking Designed to Not Work? Web link, cxcc.to slash a151. For a look at the history of IDEO inventing design thinking, I examine how IDEO knows design thinking is going wrong and is mostly theater, but hasn't iterated on design thinking to solve these wicked problems. Is design thinking the same as human-centered design or user-centered design? A 2022 senior lead UX designer job posted by at and says that you will, quote, create new innovative customer experiences through modern practices of design and design thinking methods, end quote. The job description says, quote, you're well-versed in user-centered methodologies and design thinking, end quote. Seeing a Fortune 50 company clearly delineate between user-centered design and design thinking helps us understand that these are not the same approach or method. Some differences between design thinking and user-centered design include 1. Design thinking is sold as something you do quickly. It only requires hours or days of team workshops. When done correctly, a thorough UCD process can take weeks or months. UCD is a quality over speed model. And you can be sure when IDEO gets a consulting project, they spend more than five days on it. 2. Design thinking is solution focused. The goal of workshops and exercises is to create potential solutions. If we haven't correctly defined problems, how likely are we to come up with the best solutions? If our problem statements are incorrect or guesses, what risks have we created? UCD starts with research aimed at truly understanding people, contexts, and systems so that we can correctly define problems, unmet needs, and opportunities. 3. Design thinking doesn't guarantee that anybody empathizes or defines the problem correctly. Some teams do little or no research before their design thinking exercises or design sprint. They start with what they assume, guess, or hope about users. You probably know teams who started aspirology exercises with something they wanted to build anyway, hoping to prove their idea is good. UCD starts solution agnostic. We start with questions and problems without considering yet how they might be solved. 4. Design thinking is attendee-centric. We choose a solution by having people in the room vote on their favorite. We ask how might we when neither the problem nor the solution is about us. UCD chooses a solution by testing over and over with target or existing customers so that we can be sure what we are creating matches real people's needs and tasks. User-centered design has customer centricity in its name. 5. A poor idea or poor execution of a good idea might be crowned the winner. If the selected idea isn't 5 stars out of 5 quality, this is very risky for our project and company. UCD is focused on quality and is unlikely to move forward with a poor concept when CX practitioners are given the time and budget to do great work. 6. Design thinking seems to have low or no standards for prototyping and testing. It often sounds like any coworkers you can find or anybody you can grab in a coffee shop is a good testing participant because, hey, let's do this fast. UCD would require proper testing planning participant recruiting and selection, and often a prototype that is more realistic to the experience. End of list. I don't need design thinking because I use user-centered design and critical thinking. I've never needed a design sprint. Nobody has ever asked me to stop doing my user-centered design work and just do design thinking instead. Design thinking is marketed very differently to CX and UX professionals 
versus those outside the CX and UX profession. Outside of CX and UX, people are sold on the promise that they will think, work, innovate, and solve problems like IDEO's best designers. Inside CX and UX, we are told that getting our coworkers trained on design thinking and bringing it into our companies will sell the value of CX and UX jobs, design, customer centricity, and human centered design. These opposite promises are both false promises. Design thinking does not turn non CX roles into CX geniuses, even after some training and a certificate. Design thinking has rarely given human centered design a real seat at the table, amplified customers' voices, and made teammates understand and appreciate what CX and UX staff do. The opposite has happened. Design thinking has taught non CX roles that they can do what CX roles do, no experience, education, or talent required. Just use design thinking. I sometimes hear that design thinking is a Trojan horse. We'll take a company that doesn't care about users, introduce design thinking, and once they're into it, we'll introduce human centered design as the better way to go. One key problem is that design thinking doesn't present itself as a first step or beginner way to get into human centered design. Design thinking presents itself as the best way to solve problems, innovate, and create PSE. Therefore, if teammates fall in love with aspirologies, how will you explain that there is a better way? After all the design thinking fun, who will welcome human centered design and its lack of workshops, games, and Lego? Some CX or UX experts have told me stories of bringing design thinking into the company, but they used human centered design, not design thinking. By calling HCD design thinking, they got interest, support, and buy in because design thinking is hot and trendy. And since the definition of design thinking is so fluffy, nobody said, hey, wait a minute, that's human centered design, not design thinking. In these situations, I imagine HCD, under its pseudonym design thinking, is working, but we should be honest and call processes by their correct names. Sidebar Quick Fix versus Slow Fix Design Thinking and Design Sprints. If you want to reduce or eliminate aspirologies, the quick fix would be to quit cold turkey. Put your highly qualified CX team in charge of all design related workshops. They might decide that they would rather have the time and budget to do their best work and not rush into group solution brainstorming. Instead of frequent workshops and brainstorming sessions, you can also shift toward the product discovery methods recommended later in the book. The slow fix is to continue doing design thinking and design sprints, but you can start reducing the frequency and you can change their type. Start doing version three of design sprints, where qualified researchers get six weeks to do generative research. Combine that with version two of design sprints, where qualified designers create our prototypes and partner with researchers for evaluative research testing. Either fix is a good start. The Lean UX Book Lean UX is another aspirology turning CX and UX into workshops and design by committee. For reference, I'm using the 2016 second edition of the book. Core problems include. 1. The authors claim they don't want work by committee, but their definition of collaboration says that all work is a team effort, which sounds like work by committee. The authors demand that you not give any work to any individual, even if they are highly specialized. CX research and its interpretation should be done by the team. 2. It's meeting heavy. If you thought you were in too many meetings before trying Lean UX, look out. Since every CX task is done by committee, product managers, engineers, stakeholders, and others will be involved in multiple daily meetings and team exercises. 
everybody is equally involved in research, design, testing, and other important CX tasks, and these all occur in meetings of two or more people. 3. Over-reliance on what stakeholders want. Quote, We found it helpful to begin with a problem statement. These statements are created by key stakeholders as they begin to address the strategic vision for the business. End quote. Kindle Location 645. We learned from Design Sprints version 3 that starting with stakeholders describing the problem or what challenge we're here to address was often the wrong way to start. To be customer-centric, we must define problems from the perspectives we have collected from customers, not from a stakeholder looking at business goals. These might not be aligned with or close to real customers' needs, habits, and likely actions. A stakeholder's vision should be customer-centric, but if it's not, this is risk we will need to identify and mitigate. Lean UX assumes that working from stakeholders' problem statements and team assumptions goes well. The book provides no plan B. What should you do if the stakeholder's problem statement is garbage? 4. Too much time spent on assumptions rather than collecting or using great data and customer intelligence. Many exercises in the book start and or end with collecting all of the assumptions everybody on the team has about the customer, the product, how testing went, or something else. Rather than documenting those assumptions as risks and researching to replace guesses with knowledge, Lean UX tells you to move forward with your guesses and assumptions. This isn't lean and runs against Six Sigma's desire to prioritize verifiable data over assumptions and guesswork. 5. The Lean UX book recommends nearly zero documentation because we were all in that meeting. It seems unprofessional to rely on human memories of an event so that we can avoid documenting it. Some documentation is essential. What happens when people quit, are fired, or go on extended leave? What if someone has a poor memory? What if we all remember that meeting differently? What if we are onboarding someone new to the team and they want to read existing project documentation? Will we tell them we are too lean to have that? 6. The Lean UX Canvas was mostly borrowed from a business model canvas, yet most people are not using the Lean UX Canvas to decide their business model. For a full breakdown of why the Lean UX Canvas is another flawed template likely to create risk and waste, please read my article, Critical Thinking About the Lean UX Canvas. Weblink, cxcc.to slash a184. End of list. Lean UX is a non-viable model that disempowers CX and UX. Most CX and UX professionals read and then disregarded the book when it was published. Nearly zero CX professionals wanted to see their workplace adopt this approach. But CX and UX practitioners made one critical mistake. They ignored the book and assumed it would go away instead of leaving it bad reviews and speaking up against it. They assumed that if the UX profession didn't adopt or implement Lean UX, the aspirology would be seen as a non-starter. The word Lean on the cover attracted some lovers of Agile. With very few negative reviews of the book, it was assumed that it was somewhere between okay and well-liked, and it was brought into Safe and Scrum.org. We'll cover this more, plus how to solve it, in our later chapter on task-oriented user-centered design. Some companies say that they are doing Lean UX. When I ask them to describe the process they are using, it doesn't match what the book proposes. Lean UX now means either the book or the least UX work that we can do, jumping off from the incorrect definition of Lean. Lean is about identifying and cutting waste. Excellent CX work and customer centricity are not waste we can or should cut. 
but big or other companies use aspirologies. We love to try what big companies do, even when we don't know how well it works for them. Articles announcing disruptive and amazing methods are sometimes later overshadowed by articles about how those methods didn't work. Sometimes the articles about how those methods failed are not being published since who wants to admit a methodological failure? You hear about the company's radical new model or approach, and then you don't hear much about it again. For example, at one point, people fell in love with Spotify's engineering model around teams called squads. We saw a big company doing something that sounded cool. Articles were everywhere about how great this model was. Now, the articles are all about how this model failed and might only work with serious revisions. Design thinking, design sprints, and democratization are also models we hear big companies using, so we thought we should try that too. But several articles speak out against these methods. They're harder to find since Google searches tend to optimize for positive articles, especially since the Google name is associated with design sprints. But you can find them when searching. Anytime we are trying a new method, for great reasons or for that company is doing it reasons, we need to utilize change management and governance. You can use and customize the suggested governance model at the end of the upcoming strategy and planning chapter. Design thinking, design sprints, or lean UX was supposed to transform our company. Did they? Or are you doing the same things as before, but now saying design thinking or empathy more often or running more workshops? Have you changed your ways of working other than taking the cross-functional team away from their mission-critical work more often to attend workshops? Did we teach everybody the value of customer centricity? Did the aspirology deliver or create the desired transformation? Have we rethought KPIs? Are we still a feature factory driven by velocity and how many features we shipped? A member of my community told a story about a disastrous workshop. The goal was to get internal staff together to catalog customer pain points despite not having researched them. More than 20 people, mostly stakeholders, were in attendance. One product owner declared that they already knew all of the customer's pain points because we have analytics. The PO said they should be doing the prioritization themselves and they'll let design know when we need something from you. A UX manager battled this PO for 20 minutes and asked a different PO for their top three things, which ended up being the meeting's takeaway. Not all workshops go this badly, but I have been at multiple ones like this. I have been at the 50-person workshop run by a product manager and a scrum master that asked everybody to brainstorm how to make users do what we want them to do, even though we had no research or insights explaining current customer behaviors. I have been at the 20-person workshop that hypothesized that our PSE should be addictive like Facebook and can everybody think of ways to make our PSE more habit-forming? I was not invited to the workshop where seven visual designers came up with Christmas-themed ideas. They brought these to product managers, bypassing CX and UX, and requested that engineering build and release their sketches. These are not transformative experiences. If aspirologies were working well or were transformational, we would see this reflected in both leading and lagging indicators. Are we seeing lower utilization of customer support? Is our NPS or customer satisfaction score improving? Is our cost of acquisition decreasing? while our ease of acquisition is increasing? Shift away from workshops are fun or we really had a lot of empathy and make sure that we are using solid metrics to analyze costs versus benefits for aspirologies.
If aspirologies are so bad, why aren't more people speaking up? 1. Who wants to say, hey, that thing I brought into the company that we spent all that time and money on isn't working, and we need to stop doing it? Nobody would have to admit this if we had the right governance and metrics. The people monitoring our processes and internal experiments would see what's working and what isn't, and be authorized to act on their findings. 2. Aspirologies are seen as new, modern, and the cool thing everybody is doing. The cool thing may be failing and costing you a lot of money. Few companies are calculating what they are spending and how much they are losing by following a cool trend. Forget trends and do the math. Check the cost of poor quality. Check the voice of the customer and customer satisfaction scores. We might think we are fast, but how are we really doing? Many of these skip research, design as little as possible, build, release, evolve, Techniques came from books like The Lean Startup, yet, statistically speaking, a mind-boggling percentage of startups using this technique fail and go out of business. The Lean Startup book requires more critical thinking and challenging. 3. People might feel lost without a replacement. If design thinking is an amazing process designed to solve everything, what are we going to do instead? Your replacement is human-centered design or user-centered design. 4. When CX and UX leaders battle aspirologies, they often hear, that's not agile, why are you being so negative, and other arguments that do not debate the pros and cons of aspirologies head-on. If we hear insults, negative framing, and gaslighting, we should call them out, hold people accountable for such behavior, and carry on with what we know is customer-centric. Thinking back to the interview about ethics, our company should empower staff to raise red flags and challenge the status quo. The VP told us everybody can do research. How am I supposed to go up against a VP? We wouldn't leave lower-level staff to fight leadership if we had governance. It shouldn't be VP versus staff. CX and UX leaders need to be on the front lines. End of list. Sidebar. Stepping stone. Remove voting. One customer-centric improvement you can make to your workshops is to remove voting on PSE ideas, solutions, or features. Brainstorming workshops can be fun and may yield some interesting ideas, but the best idea to work on first is the idea that best matches customers and their tasks, not the idea that happened to get the most popular votes. Being value-led and evidence-based means that we must work toward what will be the best match for customers. We should not organize our PSE roadmap based on idea popularity contests. Ideas must be moved through the user-centered design process so that our CX experts can determine the ones most likely to create customer satisfaction and loyalty. For groups who don't want to give up voting, have them vote on customer value. Put a dot on the three ideas that have the most customer value. You don't have to use this as your final prioritization, but you can see what your teammates think. End of sidebar.